Hey everybody, Pastor Paul here. Thank you so much for coming to join us again. I, I just pray that we will have an amazing, productive, and growing time this morning. You know, every time we get together, I really pray that we do grow. We, we're not here just to kill time. Besides that, I'm not that entertaining. But hopefully the value that you and I get out of our get-together is that we grow in the spirit. We grow in our faith. We grow in knowing God more. Why? Because as we grow, we can become more effective. We can become more successful. And we are closer to the destiny that God has called you and I to. So that's the reason why I'm here as a pastor. I'm not here to, to look for fans. I'm not here to look for people that are really impressed with us. I'm looking for people that, that would be wanting to walk with us that we can contribute and add to their lives so that they can grow. I can disciple them. They can grow and they can grow in the Lord. And that's the whole reason why we're here. So anyways, today we're going to continue on the studies of Abraham and his powerful studies. And uh, I don't know if I should apologize for last week we were kind of very long last week, but I'm going to make it short today. So I'm starting, I'm looking at the clock now. I'm very cognizant of the clock. And, and so let's see if we can finish what I plan to, to do today. And if we can't, we can continue next week. But really powerful studies on the book of Abraham. So I want you to turn your Bible to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. We're going to go from verse 6. We started verse 1 last week. And Genesis chapter 12, verse 6. Abram, now that was before he changed his name, passed through the land to the place of Shechem and to the oak of Moreh. At that time, the Canaanites were still in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your offspring, I will give you this land. So he built an altar to the Lord. Now, if that's your Bible, underline that, that phrase. He built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And from there, he moved to the hill country of the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there, again, he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And then Abraham journeyed on and still going toward Najeb. Now, I want you to pay attention. This wasn't the first two times Abraham had built the altar. You will notice that throughout his life, and in fact throughout the life of his children, his children's children, in fact many generations, even the Israelites, is that building altar was a very common practice for him and his children and his descendants. And it's a very critical component of their relationship with God, of their walk of faith. And so one of the first things I want to talk about today is I want to encourage you to build your altar. Not just one altar, many altars in your faith journey. You know, altar serves several purposes. I'm going to name three. The one is that an altar is actually an acknowledgement of the God that you serve in faith in your journey with him. You know, uh, when you acknowledge God, but in your way, he will bless you. you no, know, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 says this. Proverbs 3, verse 5. The Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, now that's the key here now, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight, or make straight your path. Now, a lot of people ask, how do I acknowledge God? Well, you honor Him, you obey His Word, and you be aware of His presence, be aware of Him, and thanking Him in all that He given to you. Wait on Him. You know, that's how you honor God. And so, so, number one, the altar is to acknowledge God. I'm going to get into more specific about how you built an altar. But I want to get to the second point is that an uh, altar serves also as a test testimony of God's faithfulness to those who will be coming after you. So we're talking about living a life outside yourself, even your lifetime. We're talking about living a life that is for generations to come. You, the people for the generations to come will not know about your faith unless you have an altar that is built visibly to them. I want to get more to that later on. And number three is uh, an altar serves as a reminder of God's faithfulness to us. 
You build an altar because you want to remind yourself how God is faithful to you. And so in the years to come, you will remember his faithfulness. You see, we tend to be quite forgetful. And because we are very forgetful, we cannot remember the goodness of God, especially when, when we're in a hard time. You know, you hear a lot of good testimonies, a lot, about a lot of good things happening to different people. And uh, sometimes you feel jealous and envy, and be, but you forgot that God has been faithful and good to you, and that you forgot about all the goodness that he had, all the encounter you had with him, and you just kind of forgot about it. Why? Because you haven't built an altar for yourself to remind yourself how good God is. You see, the problem is that a lot of people who do not have altars in their life, they become or tend to become entitled. Friends, I want to encourage you to build an altar. Now, the next question is, how then do we really build our own altar? You know, one of the first things that I always encourage spiritual people to do is to have a, jour a journal. Journal is very important. I still read some of the journal that I wrote years ago when I first started this church 20 years ago. Boy, I tell you, I could see the faithfulness of God. And not only that, you know, one of the things, one of the altar I have is my checkbooks, my bank checkbooks. I kept a lot of my checkbooks, all the transaction, and I would look back at you know, my income, you know, where God was at, you know, when when I was, in, you know, when I was 20 years old, what my, you know, account was like, and, you know, just be able to compare, just, just be able to see the faithfulness of God. That's my altar. You know, my mom and dad, uh, this is actually my, my mom's idea, my parents, when they, uh, when they were pastoring a church back home, and uh, they, uh, they uh, come up with this amazing idea. I don't know whether they came up themselves or, or they learned it from somebody, is that every time when they experience an amazing goodness of God, like a miracle, like my healing, her healing, or my mom's healing, or every time when we experience some miracles at home, you know what she would do? She would throw a big party called Thanksgiving party. On her, she used her own money to buy meals for everybody in the church. And you know, after that, people kind of follow. So you see, you know, our church seemed to have a lot of party going on because, you know, they learned from my mom about how to build an altar for God by having having a big Thanksgiving party. And so, you know, they spare, spare uh, no expense, just, just throw out, a, you know, get the best meal, cook the best things. And, you know, and also the, the church kind of took on that too. The church at, at, at its herself, you know, our church, you know, I remember one time they, they're celebrating, I guess, I guess they gave out a million tracks or some crazy numbers. And so we had a big Thanksgiving uh, uh, a party for the church, you know. And, and so building an altar is very important, and that's one of the ways you can build altar. Now, uh, another way you can build altar is sharing what the Lord has done for you. Listen to this, especially to your children. Sharing what God has done for you, especially to your children. You know, one reason why we have such a detailed account of the Jewish history in the Bible, more so than most culture, is because even before they have the history written down in Torah, in the Bible we know of today, even before the first word is being written down, the Jewish people has a very strong tradition of passing the stories of the ancestor, of the family, orally from one generation to another. They were able to transmit the history in details of what God is doing or has done for them, for their ancestors or their forefathers in very details. They were able to transmit that orally from one generation to another. That's why Moses was able to capture a lot of the information that he was able to write it down so that we can read it today from the, from the, from the, from the Pentateuch and then so on and so forth. You know, all the other prophets and so forth. So if you notice in the Bible is that even David or different people, you know, when they write the Psalms or whatever, and some of the Psalms, it's like a recount of the entire history of their people. You know, why, why would they, how did David know about this? Because growing up, you know, the family tradition, the Jewish family tradition has always been passing on their, their experiences as a race uh, orally from one generation and another. You know, this is what I want to encourage you. Mom and dad, it's time that you tell the story of what God has done for you 
to your children. Yes, it's good to read the Bible, do Bible study for them. That's important. But more importantly, begin to transmit the faithfulness of God. Tell them your stories. I love to tell my kids stories. You know, sometimes we sit down at home and have dinner. I'll be telling them the, the stories, you know, you know uh, how we were so poor, you know, it, you know, stories like that. And just, just try, trying to transmit to them orally the faithfulness of God. That's the monuments or the altar that I'm trying to build. You know, throughout the history, if you read the Bible, there's a lot of times uh, people of God, you know, prophets, kings, and, and leaders would encourage people to build altar. And that's the monuments to remember the goodness of God. So I want to encourage you to do that. So mom and dad, tonight when you're reading Bible stories to your children, tell them a little bit about your stories, how he had been so faithful to you. And that stories will stick with them forever. You know, I don't know if you remember the stories your parents told you. I know many of you remember those stories. You know why they're important? You know why you remember them? Because they told you the stories. But you may not even remember any scripture or anything that they, they would teach you, but you remember their stories. So stories are important. That is your altar. I want to encourage you from this point onwards in your journey with God. I pray that throughout your journey from now to the day you meet Jesus, your journey will be full of altars, not only for yourself, but especially for those that will be coming after you. They will see your stories. I want to encourage you, you know, not only disciple your children. Another way to build altars is you disciple people. I wonder if you look back in your life, you'll be able to see some of the people that you have discipled, that you have, number one, just brought to the Lord, and number two is that you built up their faith. You know, and they may not stay with you forever, but that at least you contributed into their lives. And when you get to heaven, I wonder if the angel of the Lord or the Lord himself will show you the altars that you built through disciple people in your lives, bringing them to the Lord, reminding of the faithfulness of God and changing their lives because of the altar. That's an altar. You know, each person that you change is an altar that you built. Each person that you have contributed to their walk with God is an altar you've built. You know, Paul the Apostle always spoke about, you know, uh, very fondly of the people that he discipled, the churches he started. He said, you have many teachers, but you have only one father. That means that he was the one to contribute to their well-being, to their life, to their faith, to who they are. Yeah, they're listening to a lot of teachers, a lot of teachers out there, but many people like, you know, today, they, they don't have a father because nobody have ever contributed into their lives. Friends, if you have found somebody that's willing to contribute into your life, I tell you, you got to hang on to it with dear life. It's not easy, you know. But anyways, let's move on to, to verse 10. Uh, verse 10, Genesis chapter 12, verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land, so Abraham went down to Egypt to sojourn there. For the famine was severe in the land. Now, watch this. I'm going to pause you a little bit and explain to you this. In this instance, Abraham decided that he was going to immigrate to, immigrate to Egypt because the economy was horrible in Canaan. You know, there was famine in the land, no food, so everybody was immigrating to Egypt. You know, Egypt, of course, in the Bible, is the worldly system. I want you to notice this. If you've been in the church long enough, you would have heard the story of his son, um, uh, grandson Jacob, wanted to do the same thing, is to immigrate to Egypt. Egypt, you see, but when his grandson actually did it, God forbade him. Say, no, you can't do that. See, his son tried to follow the dad to do the same thing. Every time when there's a trouble, they will naturally go to Egypt. They will naturally go to the worldly system. That's the problem with a lot of believers, right? Uh, you know, uh, before we even consult the Lord, it doesn't mean that Egypt is, is no good or whatever, but sometimes it's good for, for, for this example, Abraham um, uh, uh, basically just decided to go to Egypt, try out the worldly system like everybody else is doing. But God didn't say a word this time. This is my point. Never put God 
or what you think he expects or how he will respond to your situation in a box. This is what it means. Don't be presumptuous about what he expects of you in a certain situations or how he would react or respond to a certain situation in your life. Now, even if you found yourself in the same situation as last time, don't assume that what he did for you last time, he's going to do exactly the same thing. Sometimes he might want you to go to Egypt. You know, sometimes he might want you to use the worldly system. He had made provision for you, in other words, through the worldly system. You know, I want to give you an example of, uh, of one of the brothers in our church. You know, he needed an organ transplant. He was really sick. But he's, this brother, I'm sure he's watching now, right now, he's, he was so full of faith. And he was telling everybody and even a doctor, I don't need a transplant. I'm going to believe in God with miracles and signs and wonders. He's going to heal me. And I believe that with all my heart. You know, on my way to the hospital, a few brothers were driving me there. And uh, I was listening to them telling me about what he said to them. And the Holy Spirit immediately prompted my heart. Holy Spirit says, tell him to go ahead with the transplant. And it was very counterintuitive for a word of faith guy. Like I'm, like, I'm a faith guy. I'm totally in faith. But you know, I obeyed the Lord. I went and I told him, I said, listen, I thought the Holy Spirit tells me that you need to go ahead and take this transplant. It's good you have faith, but this is the provision for you this time. Now, later on, you know, he was testifying that, you know, for people to have his kind of organ transplant, they usually have to wait years and, you know, months and even years to get the transplant. But, you know, because he obeyed the Lord, that the, the organ that was, uh, uh, that what he needed was available immediately for him. And the interesting thing is that one of the sisters in the church, she was in the operating room, was operating on a person that had, had, pronounced, had been pronounced dead and that she was harvesting the organ. Didn't know that that very specific organ was for this brother. They went to the same church. Now, look at the miracle of God, right? So you do not presume that God is going to only operate in one way or the other. Sometimes we need to reframe from leaning on the worldly system and trust and wait on God. But sometimes we need to be willing to say, God, whatever and however you want to respond to my situation, I will obey you. So this is the key. Don't be presumptuous or it would be very costly to you. Do you know, even when Jesus was on planet Earth, when he healed people, he never healed people the same way, even if it is the same sickness. I'll give you four examples. Well, I don't have the scripture, but if you have your pen and pencil, or pen, pencil, pen or pencil and a notebook, this is what you write down. See, in John chapter 9, verse 1 to 12, when Jesus was confronted with this blind person, this is what he did. He spat on the ground, and he mixed his saliva with some mud, and then he took it out and put it on a person's eyes, and then told him to go to the pool of Siloam to wash it off. Now, that act itself is a bit extreme, but you never, you can never, 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 you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you can never, you can never put God into any box. In other words, he will, he, he will, he will do whatever he wants to do. He needs to do at the right time. So he, he's, you know, I can just imagine a lot of people go, no, gross, man. I will never let him do that to me. Well, then you're going to lose. Then it'll cost you. Right? So, so people say, well, what about just laying in on hands and then speak some tongue or put some anointing oil? That's the way that we've been doing all this time. It should work. Surely if God worked the last time, it will work this time. Logically, yes. But God never walks or worked in, in, in a logical way. So he, he spat. And then the second time in Mark, chapter 8, verse 32, Jesus this time, he only spat on the person's face. <laughs> you know, blind, same, you know, a, a blind man, same blindness, same disease. And Jesus go on his face and then put, put his hands over it. That's kind of weird. But still, 
It's a different way that he did it with the same sickness. And if you go to Mark chapter 8, verse 32, uh, sorry, Mark chapter 10, verse 46, this time, you know, Jesus didn't do anything. He just said, your faith had healed you. Boom, the guy got healed. No saliva, no mud, no water, no washing, not even laying off hands. Just his proclamation, the person got healed. And the fourth one, fourth blind person. See, the fourth blind person, he came to Jesus, you know, and Jesus, the Bible say, just touched him. Bam, he got healed. Same disease, four different ways of healing. My point is this. If you know, if you know that you, if, you, if you want God to respond to you, never put him in a box. Don't be presumptuous. Don't assume what it was doing last time is going to be what he's going to do next time. That's what I say all the time about revival. You know, people like me love to see revival. Revival meaning, what we mean by that is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That people will just turn their heart to God and, 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 and many people get saved, you know. And, uh, but, you know, if you study the history of revival, God never repeated what he would do in revival twice ever. So what he did on the Pentecost uh, in 1906, the Pentecost revival uh, was not the same as he did for the healing revival or the, uh, the Lateran revival or the uh, airport church revival. It's all different. And even prior to that, you know, the, the word revival, the great awakening number one, great awakening number two, it's all different. God always do different things. You know, if you know of any person who is creative, I consider myself to be creative, meaning that, you know, I like to do creative things. See, right? If you know of anybody who's creative, they always would be looking for things to do differently. On, you know, they're always looking for ways to do things differently uh, on the same thing. You know, they're looking for creative way to address the same problem. And uh, they can never rest on the same way. You know, that's a saying that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Those, that, that statement, it doesn't work for creative people. Creative people, even if it's not break, broken, we still want to fix it. We still want to do something. We still want to improve upon it, you know? That's what creative people do. And you know what? God is the most creative person in the whole universe. And you can never expect him to do the same thing twice. He might. Again, don't put him in that box either on that front. But don't ever be presumptuous. What he, what he requires of us Every time when we lean on him, it's this one thing. Trust and obey. Don't assume. Okay? So let's move on to verse 11. All right. We, we, we're going on the right speed now. Verse 11. Now, when he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you're a woman beautiful in appearance. She was already 75, and she still looked pretty. You know, just a commentary here. <laughs> you know, if you trust God, man, you can look pretty even when you're 99. Anyway, so, so uh, verse 12. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. And they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say, you are my sister, that he may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. So he's actually telling half truth, right? Well, it is true, but he's, you know, that his sister, he married his sister, like we said last time. But, you know, he, he's, they, they're married nonetheless. So verse 14, when Abraham entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw the woman was very beautiful. And when the princess of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman, 75-year-old senior, so beautiful, that was taken to Pharaoh's house to become his wife. For her sake, he dealt well with Abraham and had sheep, oxen, male donkey, male servants, male servants, female donkeys, and camels. Verse 17. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. <laughs> it wasn't even his fault. So when Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him, and they sent uh, Abraham and his wife and all that he had. Wow. I want you to pay attention to this. Here, Abraham was actually planning to deceive the Egyptians to protect himself. That's a very natural thing. Now, it would appear that it's quite harmless on the surface. 
But if you look into it, he was actually putting his wife well-being in harm's way. In fact, some people have interpreted that he actually, this Pharaoh actually had intimate relationship with her before God afflicted Pharaoh because she had already become his wife and that's why he gave all kinds of stuff to Abraham. And so whether that's the case or not, um, none of us would put our wives in harm's way to protect ourselves. Right? I mean, we're man's men. No man ought to put his wife in harm's way just to protect his own behind. You know, sorry. <laughs> sorry for saying that. But, you know, it gets us mad when a man is so cowardice. It's that like you put your, the well-being of your wife on the line so that you can protect yourself. See, Abraham did that, right? And not only that, Abraham was supposed to be the man of faith. You know, and, uh, and that God had been, you know, God had talked to him. He had talked to God, you know, and uh, he seems to be the one that trusts God or had all the faith in God about everything. And yet, when it comes time to face possible harm, he resort to tact tactics that put other people's, even his loved one, in harm's way. Whatever happened to his faith? Right? Is he supposed to be a man of faith to trust God or, or what was he doing? He didn't sound like he was, he was having so much faith. You know, in fact, we're going to talk about the stories later on uh, next week. Is that, you know, instead of listening to God about having children, he actually listened to his wife. You know, he listened to his wife to, to try to help God. It wasn't in the will of God, but he was listening to his wife. This man of faith. Where is this man of faith? See, here's the amazing thing about Abraham's story. I want you to listen to this very carefully. God still considers him a man of great faith. Mm hmm Yes. God still consider him a man of great faith. You know, in a discussion of Abraham in New Testament throughout, God never mentioned about this act of unbelief or any of the act of unbelief that he had. See, in your faith journey, you and I need to know that not only Abraham, but many of the faith general that was listed in Hebrews chapter 11, many of them, we consider them amazing faith hero received the same grace. I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11. Right? We're talking about Abraham's wife now. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past age since she was considered him, she considered him faithful who had promised. Now, look up here. Sarah seems to have a lot of faith to believe in God, to be pregnant and have children. And yet, if you know the story, Sarah actually didn't believe. Sarah actually laughed at the person who told them that she was going to be pregnant. She didn't believe. But you know, when the Bible records about Sarah's faith, all her unbelief seemed to have been forgotten. You know, some people would say, you know, you know this, this Bible here, man, they tr they're trying to make everything perfect when it is not. But that is not true. You see, not only Sarah, but go to verse 32. Check this out. Go to verse 32. Verse 32, what more shall I say? For, for time would fail me to tell you about this great hero of Gideon. <laughs> Gideon actually challenged the angel who called him. You know, and, and, and ask God to prove himself. So much of the faith. And God listened, right? How about Barak? Barak was challenged by the prophetess Debbie to go to warfare. He was too chicken. He said, I'm not going to go. I'm only going to go if you go with me. And then Samson, and you know the story of Samson. My goodness, right? That guy, he committed so many errors, so many sins, you know. And then David, of course, you know, Samuel and all the prophets, every single one of them had problem with their faith. And yet in New Testament, in the New Testament of our Bible, none of their problems were being mentioned. This is my point. I want you to pay very close attention to this. And I'm going to close. To walk in faith effectively, you need to know the grace of God really well. You need to know 
that he is the God who forgets our mistakes of the past because his grace is so vast. You know, if you look at Abraham and all the other guys that I mentioned, Sarah, you know, you know Gideon, Barak, Samson, you look at their lives, they were not walking a perfect life. In fact, they, some of them were outright, oh, you know, rebellious, outright, you know, in unbelief. And this is how God sees us under grace. In the New Testament, it's grace, right? It's God sees the victories we have, and he forgets about the weaknesses and the failures we had. I want to tell you how amazing your God is. You know, when we willing to trust him, even in our failures, his grace is still sufficient. You see, if you don't understand the grace of God, you will always be in the mindset of the fact that you are not good enough. And when you always have this idea that you're not good enough, you always feel inadequate to receive the goodness of God, the blessing of God, and the answer to your, uh, having God answer to your prayers. When you feel like you're not good enough, you will always feel like you are not adequate to receive from God. Miracles, prayer answers, and blessings, so on and so forth. You need to get that out of your mind. If any time in the future that the devil will accuse you that you're not good enough, I want you to remember Abraham. I want you to remember Sarah. I want you to remember Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel. All these guys who had made mistakes in their lives and have something that is shameful in the eyes of men. And yet, because of the grace of God, he overlooked them and he called them champions and heroes. I think I'm talking to many heroes and generals today watching this. You've been told that because of all the mistakes you've had, you will never be good enough for God. But you know, I want you to learn from all those guys that I just talk about, from Abraham to all the characters I talk about, is that continue to lean, trust, obey God in his book. He will always remember your victories and he will forget about your mistakes. He promised that. He promised that he will forget about your mistakes. So the key to have an effective faith then is to lean very hard on God's grace, not on your self-righteousness. And any given time, if you think it is your work, your effort, your righteousness that's going to accomplish great things, that's when you have failed. That's when Paul says you have fallen from grace. Fallen from grace in its original meaning is not you sin. Fallen from grace, if you read Galatians, it means you've decided not to trust God's grace anymore and you've decided you can do it on your own with your own right. Righteousness. I hope you've been blessed with this teaching this morning. And I pray that God would have encouraged you and ministered to you.